The Clippers make their first step in keeping the band together. I can give you two reasons to be optimistic about a Rams playoff run, and the Galaxy explore new worlds in building a team. And yes, I hate myself for that pun more than you know. Good morning, I'm James. This is your daily dose of sports and snark for the greatest sports city in the world, Los Angeles. This is the Faithful Angelino's Morning Report. So it is January 11, 2024. I want to start off, a viewer says that I made a mistake yesterday. I didn't go back to verify whether or not he's right or not. But if I did, let's correct it now. There was a transfer from USC, Tackett Curtis, the linebacker. According to the viewer, I said Washington. It is Wisconsin. I know it's Wisconsin. It was super early when I made the tape. Why did I not go back through and find out if I made a mistake? Because I'm not that cocky, folks. If I goof, I'm just going to admit it and go on. But anyway, do you like being in the know about LA sports? Well, if you do, clickety-clack the like button. Clickety-clack the subscribe button. There's a notification bell. Hit that. It'll let you know we drop new content. Sharing is caring. Let people know we exist. And by all means, comment, because I do like hearing from you, even when you point out if I'm wrong. My ego is not that big. Before we go through the news and notes, a look at the scoreboard. Paul George scored 29 points, possibly playing for a new contract. And the Clippers wind up defeating Toronto, 126 to 120. Boogie Ellis scores 16 points, which means the Trojans didn't have a good night. They fall back to eight and eight. Washington State 72, USC 64. Meanwhile, today, Phoenix is at the Lakers at seven o'clock. The Kings are at Florida at four o'clock, lugging a six game losing streak on their back. And Utah is at UCLA, also at six. The Bruins are only hitting 29% of their three point shots. That is the lowest in school history. You wanna know why the US, uh, UCLA is struggling? There's your answer right there. Now, hours before tip off yesterday, the Clippers announced that they reached an agreement, an extension with Kawhi Leonard. Three years, $152 million. Now, oddly enough, that's a break for the Clippers. $152 million may not sound like a break to you and I, but it actually is. Because he could have taken the max. But he didn't. And I think the reason for that is because he knows the team is working on an extension for Paul George. And as you know, you can only spend so much to keep your players even under the salary cap. So any little break the Clippers can get to try to keep everybody together is a good idea. Signing either Paul George or Kawhi Leonard would have ridded the Clippers of a major headache. If you think about it, they are going to move into the Intuit Arena, which is just about a block or two away from SoFi Stadium next year. You lose both of them, you, mm, you're not exactly selling seats and moving merch into that shiny new crib. Now, I'll be frank with you, I don't think there are too many teams with the cap space that could sign Paul George anyway. Philadelphia could, but I can't imagine James Harden is telling him that that's a good idea. Now, keep in mind, keeping Leonard does make sense not just in terms of selling tickets. He's a two-time NBA Finals MVP, for example. So when push comes to shove in the playoffs, he's a guy you'd actually want on your roster. The downside, though, is he's 32 and injury-prone. So the point is, there is a gamble involved here, but one of the greatest players in the game today is going to retire as a Clipper. You still have to ask, though, what is going to be the makeup of this team next year? Months ago, as you all know, the Clippers traded for James Harden. I bring that up because when the deal occurred, the thinking was that Harden was just an insurance policy in case either Leonard or George left. For his part, it's clear that Harden wanted to play for an extension as well. Now, LA might be strongly considering keeping all three of them. You know, Harden is no longer the insurance policy, and they're winning. They weren't early, but now they've won seven of the last 10 games. You will eventually hear a lot about Harden wanting an extension of his own. The difference, though, between 
Leonard, George, and Harden is that Harden is not allowed to sign an extension. He has to wait until he becomes an unrestricted free agent in the summer. But can the Clippers keep all three under the cap? I don't know. Recall, the NBA strengthened restrictions on its salary cap going into this year. When the Clippers traded for Harden, by the way, when the Clippers traded for Harden, their, the tax that they have to pay for being over the salary cap ballooned to more than $128 million. That's just the tax. What is the salary cap in the NBA this year? $135 million. So in other words, the Clippers are paying almost twice as much than the salary cap for this team. I know Steve Ballmer has money you and I could only dream of, but that is still an amazing amount of jack that's being forked over. So anyway, the good news, the cornerstone of the franchise stays. Question who else can? You let me know what you think in the comments thread. So the scribes asked Rams quarterback Matthew Stafford what he is expecting about his first return to Detroit since being traded to LA. And that's just the first time. He's gonna be asked like every five minutes by a scribe until the game is over. And he gave the bland answer that you would expect. And by bland, I mean, he lied. Quote, oh, I'm not expecting anything to be honest with you, unquote. Now, not to be outdone in this cliche contest, former Rams QB and current, Rams, uh, current Lions quarterback Jared Goff was just as milquetoast in describing his relationship with Sean McVay. Quote, obviously, we had our differences there at the end, but he's a great coach. Sean and I are good, unquote. Yawn, snore, break wind in your sleep. I mean, that doesn't tell you anything. What really bugs the hell out of me is that the scribes are trying so hard to drum up fake emotional stories for this game is that nobody's even telling you who can win or why. Nobody's getting into that. I'm not saying that the Rams are absolutely going to make the Super Bowl but if you happen to be in Vegas and you want to place a bet on the Rams, I can give you at least two reasons why you might consider it. One, with Kyron Williams on the field, the Rams offense, according to analytics, is top five in the game. Which that means is that even if they fall behind early, they could theoretically be comfortable getting into a shootout. That, and the only game, by the way, that they've lost in the last couple of months was on the road in overtime at Baltimore. Now, why'd they lose? Well, that's the reason they could lose any step along the way in the playoffs. Their special teams are garbage. But if you're looking for reasons for optimism about the Rams, offense is it. And the fact that they're already on a run. The transfer of Gabriel Peck from Brazilian side Vasco da Gama to LA Galaxy was completed yesterday. The Galaxy paid a club record $10 million just to the team in order to make the transfer happen. Now, Peck scored 14 goals across all competitions last year. He's going to be a designated player, just like Ricky Pouge is a designated player. This leaves the Galaxy with one more DP slot available to use. Now, we talked about the Rams recently, about how they were completely candid with their fan base going into last year, saying this is how we're redoing the team, this is how we're going to redo the roster, and we think we're going to be good enough to qualify for the playoffs. Now, nobody bought it at the time, but their plan went through step by step. If you're a fan, you should appreciate the hell out of that. If you are an LA Galaxy fan, you should appreciate that they're doing the exact same thing with their own fan base. You don't have to confess every move you're trying to make. You don't have to risk tampering charges by naming players. But give a confession about what the general goal is and how you're going to get there. The Galaxy's front office, their new front office, said that they prioritize getting younger, adding wingers, 
and aiming more towards South America to get players rather than making the Galaxy, frankly, a bit of a convalescent home for European legends. Peck checks every one of those boxes, every last one of them. The only box he does not check is star power. The prior administration with the Galaxy was big on that, selling tickets and jerseys with Beckham or Ibrahimovic on the back. Hell, I have jerseys with Beckham and Ibrahimovic on the back. I admit that. But if you were to say in the simplest terms, what is the Galaxy trying to do with its roster? Since most of the names, most of them you can't really recognize. I think they want players who can run like hell and are healthy enough to handle running like hell. This is going to be a team that's going to rely on quick decisions and, and quick everything in order to put goals in the net. That's just my basic thought. Meanwhile, we've been searching for updates on LAFC trying to keep their core together. And it would be nice to know, considering that players are supposed to report for physicals in 10 days, guys. But the most I can tell you about LAFC is that there were reports that free agent midfielder Kellen Acosta is talking with Chicago Fire. There is a possibility that six key players from a team that reached the MLS Cup final last year could be Gonzo. Could be Gonzo. Now, I realize general manager John Thornton has built up a lot of goodwill over the years, but ask UCLA basketball how much overturning that much of your, of your roster can impact the team. Oh, it totally can. Billy Fessler, most recently the offensive coordinator over at Akron, has left that school to coach quarterbacks over at UCLA. Uh, the Bruins' last quarterbacks coach, Brian Gunderson, he left the school so he could become the offensive coordinator at Oregon State. Fessler will oversee the continued development of Ethan Garbers. 24-7 Sports first reported the news. But here is an interesting little oddity. Um... The Athletic likes to rank all 133 football teams. Not just give you a top 25, literally every last team. Now, neither UCLA or USC is in the top 25, which is fine. Makes sense. But they have the Bruins at 33, ahead of 34th ranked USC. There's not much of an explanation as to why, I might add. But if you really wanted to tell me, I'm all ears. I'm not saying USC is going to the college football playoffs, but could you give me a rationale as to why you would slide UCLA over USC, considering the fact that USC has at least been addressing its defensive problems, how they probably have their quarterback for next year in Miller Moss? I don't necessarily know what you could say about UCLA that would be as positive. But you let me know what you think in the comments thread. Talk to me about the future of the Clippers. Tell me if you think the Rams are capable of a playoff run. Or if you think the Galaxy have finally figured out how to work things in today's MLS. And if you enjoy the content, don't forget to subscribe to Faithful Angelinos. We talk LA sports here every single day. Thank you for watching. I'm James. We'll be back tomorrow. Faithful Angelinos is a Kian Corte El Queso production. Take care.